talking about. Now you get the music. Yeah. Right. Hey, 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 thank you. Thank you. Sure. So I really wanted to have you. I don't know if you, when, when, this, when this announcement first came out, I literally sent them an email and I said, I said we got to start the day with this conversation because this is really what's, what's changed um, and feels like there's a sea change taking place in business, I think. We'll see if there's really a sea change uh, taking place in business. But this, this is what you did. You said for the first time, uh, I shouldn't say for the first time, but you, you rewrote it uh, to say that CEOs now commit to lead their companies for the benefit of all stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers, communities, and shareholders. I will note that shareholders was last on the list. We can debate and talk about that uh, in a okay. second. But in some ways, this is a rebuke uh, to the economist Milton Friedman, who, by the way, wrote a fabulous article you should all go read uh, in the New York Times Magazine in 1970, um, talking about actually how profits can't happen without purpose and actually that, that business shouldn't be responsible for society. So I want to understand how this happened in reality, and then I think we should have a vigorous debate about it. How did with, it with you? Uh, I, and there's some probably oh. people in the audience as well. But how did it happen, Alex? Well, first of all, Andy, thanks for having us here. It's always great to be able to share the stage with Jenny, uh, somebody who I have tremendous respect for. Uh, but uh, if you look at the lineup, all I have to say is I'm glad we're going first this morning, that we don't have to follow some of the, you know, Kim Kardashian and a few of the others <laughs> later on. Uh, so. Thanks for having us on first. But um, I guess if we go back and kind of tell the narrative or the story on it, um, you know, I, uh, I had an opportunity, as you uh, outlined earlier, that uh, Jamie had asked me to take responsibility for the governance committee on the BRT several years ago. And uh, I'll never forget when he first came and talked to me about it with the board, I thought, you know, Jamie, what did I do wrong? I get to talk about 13D, you know, proxy access, shareholder proposals, all that really exciting uh, stuff. And, uh, and we, I think, did a fair amount of work on that. But it was about 18 months ago, uh, following a strategic planning session of the board of directors of the BRT, where we, we looked hard at this issue about the purpose of the corporation. And uh, I think it's fair to say that we had been criticized uh, externally about the statement that actually had dated back to 1997 that really was predicated upon the primacy of the shareholder, and that being your primary responsibility, ultimately, to the shareholders uh, as a corporation in our country. And, and at that time, we as a board discussed that and said, you know, let's, let's test that. Should we change? And, um, and I think prior to that, we were always actually a bit defensive, I think, saying, well, it was implicit in that statement that, in fact, to do that effectively, you needed to look out for other stakeholders. But, I think as we went through the process, we realized words do matter. And uh, you know, we, we worked through the committees. We talked to, I think, I don't know, more than 50 academics, thought leaders, people in that area. Took all that and came back. And with a combination of a little bit of Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton came up with the first few uh, drafts. And you know, I've got to say that I think when we came back and then presented the, the idea is after, again, a lot of great teamwork, staff work, um, I think we got about 185 out of over 190 members of BRT to raise their hand and support it on our first vote. Okay. Um, let's go straight to the debate, though, mm -hmm. because, as you know, while a lot of CEOs have supported it and have signed it, there's been a huge debate and critique about it. Uh, I asked Stephen Mnuchin, our Treasury Secretary, actually at a Dealbook event in Washington, whether he would have signed it, and he said no. Uh, the CEO of American Securities Association, which represents financial services, says the following. He says, make no mistake, the policy shift is nothing more than a political pandering designed to further concentrate the power of the largest special interest group groups, repair the damaged image of Wall Street, and silence the voice of American investors. What do you think of that? None of us agree with that, obviously. Um, I, I think, uh, as Alex, and Alex did a fantastic job leading this work, but one of the things I think you should note, when he said 185 out of 190, uh, this was unanimous and with little, little debate. So this was right down what everyone believed, and I think it goes back to the saying, don't let someone else define who you are. So start there. You, we have to define who we are. 
and, and why, when I listen to some of that, they're very polarized views, which is not what we, it's not the world we live in. We don't live in a binary world. None of us manage in a binary world. And I think about a couple things. For one, if you take, just take a look at those four constituents we talked about, Alex and I have talked often, it's and, and, and between those. Now, we didn't write the word and, but that's very obvious to us that if you manage for the long term, there's an and. You have to have shareholder return. And then part of the virtuous circle is all those other constituents in it, point one. I mean, to me, point two, that's very contemporary right now, which is why even one of the reasons to do it now, Andrew, is that you know in this digital era, it, it can be question mark. Is this an inclusive era or a divisive era? And it is going to be for the good of business that we make this inclusive. And inclusive means you pay attention to a number of these other issues. It will be good for your business. And then in the end, I mean, look, we're 108 years old. I firmly believe it is society that gives us a license to operate. And it is about how you behave consistently so over time. So how do you think this changes things? Well, I, to me, and what I felt about this, because there's, I've heard two sides. People say, well, if it's what you do already, why did you write it down? Well, first off, it was written incorrectly to what we did before. But the second is, I think it does raise the bar. Not everyone does all those things. And frankly, all of us can even do them better in many ways. And so I think it puts very clearly, like, why does the Business Roundtable work on things like, I happen to chair Alex Scott Policy, which I, I was glad it was Alex, not Thank me. Thank you very much. Yes, I know. I got education and workforce. And um, it, it does make you then put square, this is not altruistic things to do. This is both good for business and right. good for society. So that's why we did it now. And it, in, we can talk about the policy agenda. You know, you talk about this conference being at that intersection. I think it really highlighted a number of different areas that the Business Roundtable took positions in in policy that it might not have before. And Andrew, to your earlier point, look, we knew going in that this was going to cause some debate. Uh, and the fact that I don't know, I think the day afterwards that it was, uh, there was an editorial in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial team. Times, and The Economist, all with you know, very loud, different points of right. view. That's exactly, I think, you know, one of our ideas was, how do, we, how do we get this conversation going in a different way? And, uh, and, and we knew that there would be some that would say, well, if you've been doing that anyway, what, you know, what changes is going to happen? Well, we've talked a lot about at BRT lately and through some of the policies that Jenny's worked on around how do we change the workforce? How do we think differently about it? taking a position on minimum wage, taking an uh, a position on infrastructure? And I think traditionally BRT has taken issues on business policy that relate to growth. And, and we said, while that's necessary, it's not sufficient. How do we take that and, and do it in a more inclusive way, frankly, that's more reflective and I think more important in the debate that's taking place more broadly in society today. Okay, what do you make, Steve Schwartzman, uh, who co-founded Blackstone Group, who's part of your group, yes. decided not to sign it. And the reason he says that he decided not to sign it was because he said, I can't manage for five different constituents. You tell me one, I'll do all the things you're talking about, but I can't really actually manage to all of these different metrics. I need to match, if I, if, and, and he believes, to get to the profit metric, he needs to do the others anyway. You had a debate with him on the phone, I think, when this was all happening. Yeah, you, and you watched me debate with and him. And I watched her him as well. Yes. Well, like, you know, going back to the earlier comment, I thought it was fascinating that, first of all, out of our 190 companies, we had more than 185 sign up the first round. There were a couple people on there that I knew was basically going to be, hell no, we won't go no matter what. And then there were a few others that we said, look, it's really important to reach out and have a conversation. And a few were just in situations for a number of different, uh, either governance or you know, legal reasons. And, you know, it, but through that, what I found is that you know, every, every business leader obviously has to do what they think is best for their particular business and, their, and, the, and the way that they view their stakeholders. But I believe when you look at the vast majority of the CEOs on BRT, they're in fact thinking simultaneously of those stakeholders all the time. I mean, I, but, but I know to, about the question you, is, the shareholders still have to be first. This well, goes back to the shareholder primacy idea. Look, I think to uh, Jenny's point, it's and, 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 and. And by the way, I think that the, the discipline, the demands of the shareholders do require us in a way to make sure that, by the way, we are also delivering for them. 
If you're not ultimately delivering the value to your customers, you're not running a business in an effective and efficient way, you're not taking care of your employees, then, then ultimately the, the probability of you being successful as a business enterprise, therefore being able to invest and do the kind of things that you know that we're talking about just won't be. Yeah, there. Andrew, I've seen things written like this is a GU should focus on CSR and forego profits. That is not what this says. And the part to me, and again, maybe I, I had said to one of the uh, one of the uh, people writing about this, I said, take a look at everyone you've interviewed. They've run companies for a very long time, or it's stewarded because their companies have been around for a very long time. And I think back, one of our founding values was innovation that matters for ourselves and the world in the end. And so I think this idea about a virtuous circle, so what starts the circle moving? I mean, if you don't have a return to shareholders, you're unable to do these other things. Um, so once it gets going, this so, is why you go in an order. And but that's, it, of course that's, it's critical. We, you, can't, you won't be able to serve and do all of this without having an important and a profitable business over time. So think of the idea... You know, one thing I am positive of is that if you let a financial model, it drives your customer, it drives your employees, there is tons of research that will say that is not an enduring long-term model. The other model, which goes the other direction, that is, is obviously engaged employees, drive the customer, drive your results, and that becomes a circle. And so that's why I think to so many of us, why there wasn't a debate about it, and I know you're probably going to ask us, well, why didn't you put them in a different order then, right? I'm going there. And I, and I you know, we didn't actually we didn't even really think about it to, to, to do it. I mean, maybe had we done that, that would have changed some view. But I just want to go back to the point that to us, yes, you have to, of course, it is and between these things. And then they continue to move Let like that. Let me ask that. you a legal question. This is a legal question because in many states, profit, being a fiduciary, is the ultimate, is the ultimate measure. I want to read to you. This is uh, Delaware Chief Justice Leo Strine. And he writes, it is true that the business judgment rule, which is yeah. uh, how, how companies have to behave, provides directors with wide discretion, but that does not alter the reality of what the law is. If a fiduciary admits that he is treating an interest other than stockholder, stockholder wealth as an end in itself, rather than an instrument to stockholder wealth, he is committing a breach of fiduciary duty. All of these folks who signed it, seem to be at odds with that. Yeah, Andrew, we, we had this uh, extensively vetted by outside attorneys, as I'm sure you can imagine. And, uh, and we're, we're quite confident that what we put into the statement does not fundamentally change their responsibility. And of course, they've got to govern their companies based upon their you know, appropriate bylaws. But I think what's more important about this is a ph philosophical approach to the way we think about business and the role in society. And um, and throughout our discussions, I think that, that principle of how do, we, how do we think about multiple stakeholders, how do we do it and and, how do we, how do we better take care long term, especially if we're talking over decades, not just quarters, you know, our, our shareholders, we do it by making sure that we're doing it in a more inclusive and a broader stakeholder way. Um, Can I try, I mean, just if you think about the things that a business does, so one would be, as you know, we focused a lot on education, and BRT as well, both companies and Alex's company, my firm, but as well the BRT, and a lot of focus on how do we engage wider pieces of the population in this new digital era. And that now, am I doing that just for an altruistic reason? Or no, we all need the employees. You do realize how many jobs are open and people aren't qualified. And if you go to the future, some say in the next three years, 120 million people in the most developed countries of the world will have to be retrained. Now, we all need these employees. So the fact that we work on education, this to me goes back to why we do it. So as you know, we're working on policies for higher education. Today, the U.S. spends $180 billion a year on higher education, yet only a third of Americans have a college education. You can't have a college education. And in, in this right. next few years, if we demand that for every one of the new jobs coming along, we are going to have trouble to what you had all your headlines up right. there about. So we work on policies that say, take that higher education and allow people to do things like go back and get a certificate to be an EMT, even though I'm not a full-time right. student. So these are the things, so you say, is that being something that is only for the good of society? No, it is good for business and it's good for society, right? Okay, so I've been playing devil's advocate with you, but I'm gonna take it the opposite direction. So Elizabeth Warren, as you know, sends a letter to Jamie Dimon 
who's the chairman of the BRT, after you make this announcement. He says, if you and the other 181 uh, corporate executives who signed this statement plan to live up to the promises you make, I expect that you will endorse and wholeheartedly support the reforms laid out in the Accountability Capitalism Act to meet the principles you endorse. I have attached a copy of the bill. You saw the letter, you know the bill. You wrote back what? Well, we wrote back that I think we agree in principle. We don't agree with necessarily the how to get there. And uh, so, you know, look, uh, Josh Bolton, you know, responded, and um, and we think it reinforced the principles as you know right. we outlined. But we're also trying to be very thoughtful, recognizing that a company has also got to operate within its unique constructs. And when we, and if we get overly prescriptive, uh, there's a clearly a concern about what could be the unintended consequences of that. What do you think of the broader idea that over the past two years that CEOs like yourselves have been either, either thrust into a new role or uh, have chosen to take this new role into um, being a statesman of sorts, taking on political issues that historically you would have never touched? And I'm trying to understand actually why you think this has happened. I know that there's a feeling that employees and customers are pushing you to this. I think there's also a view that maybe there's a void of leadership in Washington, and so you have to jump in. What do you think? What do you think it is that's actually changed all of this for you? Well, I, I can tell you why I choose to, to speak up on certain things and to participate in things, which I think is a, a more important question than do I think I was forced to do it externally, right? Because I do think if you're going to exist for the long term, you decide the things that are paramount to that happening. And for me, it is if there are issues that undermine trust in the company, so that may have to do with cybersecurity, privacy, et cetera, and, and therefore take strong positions about it. If there are things that really impact the ability of society to want to do business with you and have society prepared, hence why we've done so much work in education, and speak out on it. And then the third is, um, to my workforce, it really matters about diversity and inclusion, and I think it's impossible to last this long without it. And therefore, speak out on things like bathroom bills and the like that you might say, well, why? So if you're clear about those lenses, I think, Andrew, the more important thing is for each of us to be clear in the lenses about what we choose to engage in, because that is far more important than feeling your thrust. And I don't think you should speak on every, every item that's out there. There have been many that I said, no, that isn't, that isn't down the middle of what it is truly important to those three things that I said here. So I would have just, I don't feel it's about speaking because of pressure. I think it's about speaking because of what you need to endure for the long term. But, Andrew, yeah. if I can just add, I think another really important dynamic, too, is you know, the, the engine of our innovation, of what we do every day, is really, it's our employees. And, and they want you to, they want you to speak it's, up it's now. It's the talents, the capabilities they have. Well, I think there's an expectation today that the employees want to work. Yes, they want to make a living. Yes, they want to be able to you know, make a contribution, but they also want to be some, part of something bigger than themselves. And they, they want to work for a purpose. And, and so what we found, uh, to Jenny's point, is, look, every company has got to be thoughtful. You have to be selective. Uh, if you get involved in everything, your voice can be drowned out, but clearly when there are issues that are directly related, what you're saying your core values, your principles, the, the space that you right. actually uh, occupy. And beyond that, I also think it's important to have an ongoing conversation with your employees because it's a little bit like a bank account. What I found is that if you have an ongoing conversation and you're making contributions to that account over time, you're building trust, you're being open, you're being transparent, you're being authentic with them, you're having, you give them the opportunity to have a debate, then I think you're going to build a lot of trust. If, because someday you're likely gonna need to make a withdrawal. And if you try to do that the day before, when you're gonna have to do that, there's not so much interest. Okay, let me talk about that bank and trust and withdrawal, and this is a J&J &J question for you, because as so many people here know, and you know uh, better than anybody, uh, your company has been under uh, 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 just a slew of lawsuits relating to the opioid crisis, related to talc, to so many things. How do you think about those lawsuits, the responsibility of the company, mm -hmm. and, therefore, and then dealing with the profit issue? Because they're reading the Business Roundtable document, you might say to yourself, you know what, we should just settle all of these immediately. Right. Right, we should just settle all of these because we care about our constituents and our customers. Look, it's, it starts with, making sure, especially the space that we work in in healthcare, that you're putting safety and quality 
and patience first in everything that you do all the time. And, and that is part of the discussion that we have with employees, so that you're creating an environment, you're creating a culture that constantly has that as a priority. And when you find yourself in a situation, for example, where perhaps your products didn't live up to the expectations, then you need to manage that. You need to deal with it in a way that's appropriate for all stakeholders, and I think we've got a, a track record of trying to do our very best in those circumstances. But there are other cases where, frankly, the, the data, the science, or the headline doesn't match the underlying reality. And in those cases, frankly, for that, those next rounds of cures or uh, options that you're trying to provide for patients, for mothers and fathers, we think it's important to take a stand. And, um, and so that's our approach. And look, and, and only by doing that can we make sure, you know, for example, in, in the milieu that you just mentioned, you know, two weeks ago we were delivering an Ebola vaccine in the DRC, uh, expanding by almost 200,000 patients, uh, you know, conducting a, a clinical trial for an HIV vaccine very nearby, and we want to make sure that, look, we're, we're ultimately we're continuing to do right. those things uh, as well. I want to open it up to questions in just one minute, but I just have one, one question. It's a philosophical question about business, but it, it deals with the opioid crisis uh, because manufacturers like yourself are now being uh, held responsible or liable in some of these situations in ways, frankly, that they hadn't historically given the various constituents, doctors, patients, drugs, the whole, the whole right. thing. And historically, Budweiser, for example, was not held liable uh, if, you, if you drank too much beer. Um, there's obviously a marketing issue in your particular case, but this nuisance, uh, this sort of nuisance law, nuisance uh, case that's being, how do you think this is gonna change business broadly? Do you think it will? Well, look, I think you have to look at each one based upon the unique circumstances of the case. And I think that's where it's really important. And, and look, we realize that some of these are very complex, difficult societal issues. Right. And, and I think as part of our uh, desire to bring about a solution, uh, it's, it's very important, I think, that we reflect on it in a very broad and comprehensive way, you know, rather than perhaps thinking that is the, the, the single most expedient fix may not be the one that actually is going to be best for all the parties concerned. Okay, I wanna take a, a couple of questions and I just wanna find, is, 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 Scott, uh, is Scott Stringer here? Scott's over here. Scott is the comptroller of, of New York City and the reason I wanted to go to Scott, if, can we get Scott on mic, is because you have actually argued to push this in some ways even farther, it feels like, than they are, in that you have actually tried to implement laws and, and push rules that would, cr that would force diversity and so many other things, social issues, on to companies, and whether you think this goes far enough. Well, let me, let me tell you, uh, it is great that you're here, and we have a document now that recognizes what long-term share owners have been saying to the biggest companies for years, which is if you have a company that's good on workers' rights, that respects diversity, real diversity, both in the C-suite and at the highest corporate levels, we believe as fiduciaries that we're actually going to create stronger companies. So I appreciate what's on paper, uh, but I am somewhat cynical that the most powerful business leaders in the world got together and said, hey, we have a new idea. A lot of the success we've had getting to this point is because share owners, public pension funds, have been talking about this and issuing shareholder resolutions, pushing companies to do the right thing. So even though we have this opportunity, it's not gonna mean anything in my view unless a plan is associated with this. So when we look at the data, there are very few women and people of color at the highest board levels. We all know that. We need a plan for that. And second, we also need to make sure that there's accountability. And share owner uh, accountability, because we want our companies to be stronger, because we need to protect the people, firefighters, teachers, pensioners, who I represent, what's the mechanism to hold you to real accountability? That has been the shareholder resolutions that's been part of this. So when you drop the share owners to sort of to the back of the, the to the back of the envelope, I have concern. And I just think to round out this conversation, we have to think about that. So I'm curious, what's the accountability? And quite frankly, wouldn't it be great to come here five, five years from now or three years from now and see a whole lot of new faces and people of different backgrounds also able to be here because they're now 
at the highest level of a company we invest in. Yeah. Well, well look, I do think that uh, this point, and again, when we published this, this idea that you do have, you can't just say these things without a plan and without results behind it. And that's for every individual company. I mean, I'm proud we've got the highest diversity of all the technology that's out there. 40% of my board is women. And so, and, and not just women, then I look at diversity from gender, from sexual orientation, et cetera, all different ways. And every company I think does, my board holds me accountable to those things. They hold me accountable to the training of my employees. They hold me accountable that the workforce has the right skills, that I in fact do the right policy decisions. And so I think in part it is uh, every company talking about what it is they have achieved. Uh, when I talk about and really believe about things like expanding the aperture on who you can hire, uh, last year in the United States, 15% of who we hired did not have a college degree. We worked on a program, six-year high school, 150,000 kids coming through. I need the employees, plus it's good for society. I'll publish those numbers. Do you so, want investors imposing that on you? I don't think, actually, I think my board should hold me accountable to how I do those things. Which we do. And, and they do. Alex happens to be on the IBM board, so uh, uh, <laughs> lovely. And so this works. But I, but I also think that where you get in trouble when it's a common metric for everyone, and I've seen this happen, is that it, the way people measure different things, you can't get apples and apples, and then it forces bad behavior. So I would prefer there to be company or industry-specific ways and then be held accountable by my board. We gotta close this up. But Scott, I have a question for you, which is, as an investor, CalPERS, uh, on the other side of the country, has been very active with ESG, environmental social governance uh, uh, stuff. And there was a report out earlier this year that showed that their divestment of tobacco cost their pensioners $3 billion. And it's very interesting because mm -hmm. from a social uh, perspective, it might have been a, a great thing in some ways, but if their job is to be responsible for the ultimate money that goes into the pockets of the pensioner, it's more complicated. What do you think of that? Well, it, it's, it's part of what mm. sort of they've signed on to now, which is a strong company also must align with what is the best practice for the country in terms of these issues. So I don't want to speak to CalPERS strategy. I don't know the details, but I can tell you uh, I've divested from guns. We've divested from the private prison industrial complex. Part of the way we looked at that was to see that it would not hurt uh, the actual returns of the pension fund. But what I would really want to hammer home today is that Talk is cheap, and while there are companies who have recognized issues like diversity and uh, those are issues, at the end of the day, statistically and data-wise, we basically have all male, right. pale corporate mm -hmm. boards. Some say they're stale, but I would say that the real challenge for these companies is how do we create right. that diversity. The only way to do that is a mechanism to hold the companies accountable. And if you're picking the board members, with all due respect, uh, and you have some independent, but not a lot of independent directors, you need to have some mechanism for people who own the company to step up and say, hey, we're recognizing a problem, can you help us? And I think that's one of the reasons why we're here today is because you listen to a lot of people, not just your board, but the, but the country and shareholders. I, and I don't think that's- Thank you, Scott. You wanna to respond to that? Was it a question? <laughs> it was a- <laughs> um, you know, Andrew, can I just yeah, please. Want a quick response? It was interesting, uh, right after we went public with this statement, um, I had an opportunity, by chance, I was speaking at a business school. And it was literally their first day in class. And um, I went out, and it turned out that the assignment for the first day in class was to do a debate about the BRT statement. And I thought, how cool is that? that we're actually bringing that to the debate just as we are right now. And I think the fact that we're having this discussion now at a different level, and you're right, actions need to align with words. I think that's a really important step for our country, for business, and frankly, for all those stakeholders. Yeah, On you. that note, I want to thank both Ginny and Alex for this fabulous conversation. Thank you.